Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today is an extremely exciting day for me. If someone were to tell me that I would one day have the opportunity to interview um, America's premier female voice over artists, I would not believe it. But today, this dream <laughs> has just gotten real. You may not know her by name, but you've probably heard her voice. She's been a big inspiration to me from a distance way back in college and still is to this day. Honestly, I cannot believe this moment is here. Randy, I'm so honored to have you here. Welcome to the Defining You podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here, Helena. Wonderful. So I like to, to start with my guests and, and ask them to introduce themselves so the audience can get to know a little more about you. So can you can we go back and give us a little bit of background? Let's go into your backstory before all of this wonderful thing happened to you. My career, like all aspects of who I am, has been a work in progress my entire life. Um, I like to say that I really came into this world. I don't think I had an original thought in my brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just was uh, a product of my environment. I had a tumultuous childhood, uh, being uprooted, you know, from parent to parent, mm -hmm. living with grandparents, um, having a lot of responsibility as a young child because. I was second to the oldest. My older brother was already out of the house. Mm -hmm. so it was my job to take care of my two younger brothers during all of this. And um, so I was sort of an angry child. Oh. I resented having a lot of responsibility from, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. So um, I was just looking for who I was. Mm -hmm. And my one constant companion at night was my transistor radio. Mm -hmm. And I listened to the radio and I became, well, I was in love with the DJs. I, I knew <laughs> all kinds of things about them. And uh, I would call on the request line and uh, I never really won any tickets. Other people seemed to be mm -hmm. much faster at dialing than I was. <laughs> but um, I think it's so interesting for me that my love for radio, for the DJs that could um, tell stories and mm. really create that theater of the mind for you. Yes. I was enamored by them. I could just close my eyes and they could take me anywhere musically with their voices. And I had never heard a woman on the radio. Interesting. So it's so interesting to me that I wound up becoming uh, not the first woman on the radio. I'm too young for that, but <laughs> one of the first, uh, especially in Detroit, where I started uh, mm -hmm. my broadcast career. And um, so I spent, a, and I grew up with brothers and spent a lot of time living with my dad. So I was super comfortable around guys. Yeah. And to get into radio when I did, um, Many of the the men, young men that I worked for and older men, they were very supportive of my career. So I was encouraged from the very beginning of being a DJ at mm -hmm. 19 and oh, having young. a full radio career at 19, getting to be the first woman on a lot of stations um, because some stations back in the day, you applied and you were a woman they would say oh thank you but we already have a woman <laughs> <That's>, yeah <laughs> so um luckily i i got to be that woman a lot and mm -hmm. uh, my radio career took me from detroit to new york to los angeles dallas and then miami uh where i met my husband and we got married and mm -hmm. he, he was in the music business and he had a recording artist that he was managing and so he got a record deal in LA with MCA records for this artist David Shelley who sadly is no longer with us he mm. died of cancer very young gorgeous kid anyway he um my husband moved to LA I was a DJ in Florida and I decided to go I had to follow my husband 
And I came out to LA and was on the radio here till I hit a 20 year career. And then that's when I did my first Oscars. I was mm -hmm. asked to audition because I was doing the morning show on the wave. And I never thought about being a live announcer, but being a DJ, you get to be on the air talking to people every single day. And so my comfort factor in front of mm -hmm. a microphone before I became a voiceover artist was incredible. So the fact, I don't know if you've ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Outliers. No. Fascinating book. I highly recommend it. And as Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours to success. So in order for you to master something, you have to be doing at least 10,000 hours. And all of those years of radio gave me 10,000 hours of sitting in front of a microphone, right. not thinking twice about mm -hmm. who's listening. And finally, when I was asked to do the Oscars, I did the audition. I was up against a number of other women and they chose me. And the day nice. that I had to do the job <laughs> as the first woman in history, I stepped up to the microphone mm -hmm. and I did it. They were very nervous. They wouldn't even let me tell anyone I was about to do it. Were you the only woman auditioning at that time? I was the first woman in history to be selected. Okay. To do the Oscars. Right. So before we go into the Oscars, because I mean, there's a lot we can say there, but I want to go back to the time when you said you had your, your radio and you would you would find your own space and you yeah. were you know you were you would go into that theater of the mind and radio was kind of an escape for you my story is almost similar to yours because i i came from the caribbean yes. um and i when i and now i know how to say it i know it's not caribbean you <laughs> come from the caribbean and you say caribbean so yes. i'm never going to say caribbean <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've had Randy and I have um, spoken <laughs> before, but um, I would listen to the radio. I, I had an, in, an, an inquisitive mind. I would listen to the radio and then I would listen to other radio stations. And for some reason, um, the radio station from Barbados would come on on our television. And one day I heard this female's voice. Mm. I'd never heard a, radio, a female voice on that radio station before. And I you know, it captured my attention. And it's not, not only because she was female, but it's the voice, the, the authority in the voice and the warmth in the voice. I felt she was actually speaking to me. I was like, wow, you mean women do that too? Because I, before that, it was only women and I actually reached out and called her and I was so excited and <laughs> I would listen to radio stations in my country as well and call there was a talking program would call and then for you know I said I this is something that really fascinated me and I I felt like I I connected with these people and it just something that just you know woke me up and yeah. I said yeah. Um, there was a new radio station uh, that was going to be launched and I saw the ad in the newspaper and I applied and lo and behold, <laughs> I was called in for an interview and I got the job. I was so scared. I'm like, what am I getting myself into? I had no experience. Yeah. And then just before the station was getting ready to open, I tried to back off. And then the manage, the station manager said, you are the only female we have. You can't do that. Do right. this right now. And so it's like, I went in, I was nervous. I mean, I was horrible in the beginning. I made a lot of mistakes, but the station manager, he believed in me. So, he, so cool. yes, he, he, he saw that this is something that I, I had an interest in it, but I had a lot of fear. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but he right. helped me and I, he would do the more, I was doing an evening show. And then I was moved to, to the morning, a morning show that was right after his show. And then yeah. every morning he'd say, Helena, just breathe. And he would get go out and you know that glass you have in the window he would stay there and he'd watch me start and then yeah. you know he'd give me the thumbs up <laughs> so so i'm looking at you and i'm like i had no idea you started off in radio so what made you move from you know listening to this radio djs and mm -hmm. think that 
this is something I wanted to do. How did you get to that place? So uh, I'll pick up the story, and but I want to insert to you that I too was nervous. I too thought, why am I doing this? How do I even have the nerve to do this? Because right. I know nothing. Mm -hmm. So in life, you will never get anywhere unless you do what scares you. You must. I agree. You must do what scares you. So to answer that question, at, um, because of the, the kind of chaotic life I had, I had gone after my junior year of high school to do summer stock in New Jersey, Andover, New Jersey at the Grist Mill Dinner Theater. And I enjoyed it. It was really learning how to build sets, paint flats, watch the actors and, you know, assist and whatever. And it got a little old for me during the course of the summer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, and the, I went to New York, I got to go into Manhattan and I knew that's where I wanted to be. So I went to New York and wanted to learn to be an actress. Mm -hmm. So I studied at HB Studios, Herbert Berghoff Studios in the village. And well, it was on Bank Street. And I was a waitress and a um, studied by day waitress by night. Then I would go home to this place that I was living in where I only had a radio once again. And mm -hmm. I listened to a woman for the first time on the air. Her name was Allison Steele and she was on WNEW. Mm -hmm. And uh, she called herself the Nightbird. She was on from <laughs> the, the Nightbird. Morning. Interesting. <laughs> She was amazing. You can Google Alice and steal the Nightbird and play I some definitely of those. Know. And she was the first woman I ever heard that was like, "This is Alice and Steel, the Nightbird." <laughs> go, go, go! And you would hear, you know, Amazon <laughs> birds like in the the Nightbird taking you through the night. And she would like, yeah, you know, here's I, some little Mose, Allison. That's or, what theater of the mind will yeah, do to you. And she just took me. I thought she was in the Amazon <laughs> playing me incredible music. I could listen to her all night long. And when I went back to Detroit, where I was from, found myself in junior college, taking commercial art, I didn't know what to do. But because um, I kind of gave up on the New York thing, I mm -hmm. couldn't sing, couldn't dance. And I'm like, how am I going to make it on Broadway if I can't sing and I'm just an okay dancer. So I went home to Detroit, like a little puppy dog with my tail between my legs. And I went to junior college and I found the radio station. And it was from that radio station, mm -hmm. we took a tour to a rock radio station, downtown Detroit. And I met the DJs and, um, you know, I was 18, 19 years old. And they were like, hey, I'll help you make a tape. I'll show you how to do this. And mm -hmm. one of the guys became my first boyfriend in radio. Uh -oh. and, <laughs> and I got hired and my radio dream mm -hmm. began. But, um, but did, you, did you know at that time that you had this amazing voice or you, did you have to develop that voice over time? I think as a kid, um, you know, we, uh, there was no internet. There was three channels on your television. There was not a lot of distractions if you stayed at home. You were either mm -hmm. reading or watching what the whole family was watching for television. Um, but if you had a telephone, my girlfriends and I used to make prank calls or we used to call boys. And because my voice seemed to be a little deeper, it was mm -hmm. a little more mature than my girlfriends, mm -hmm. I was the one who got, who would talk to the boys. And so I knew that they, that I had a good voice, that I could talk to older boys. They so thought I was older. Right. So, and that was sort of faking it, you know? And <laughs> so I, I think that's how I knew I could use my voice. What were some of the, because I mean, were you thinking of anything else? Because I know you wanted to do acting and then you say you went into radio, but were, were, were there any other points where you thought you would be something else or you just thought this is something that I'm interested in. I'm going to see where this takes me. Honestly, I mean, I have a daughter that's super smart that went through USC Marshall School of Business. Mm -hmm. She was someone that was destined for college. And okay. For higher learning. I was not. Mm -hmm. So, and as a <laughs> child, when I lived with my grandparents, my grandmother would say, you better learn to type so you'll always have a job. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't want a job where I have to type. Oh. Right? 
I want to be able to do something else. And so that's why I gravitated to what the guys were doing. No one expected them to type. Mm-hmm. And so um, <laughs> getting on the air was more important to me than working in the office at the radio station. And of course, now I regret that I was never a good typist. Mm. <laughs> I'm, you, I'm, I'm sure you can have online. You can. It's all about how you type today. So right. Um, so what were what were some of the the hard decisions you have to you had to make along the way to make your dream come true? Because we both know that this um, industry is heavily dominated and was heavily dominated by men. We have women coming in, but I still think men are still, you know, the, the ones that, are, that have the most jobs in this industry. What are some of the hard decisions you had to make along the way and, and some of the challenges that you experienced as a result? I have to say that I feel very blessed mm-hmm. with the life I had in broadcasting. I feel that every time I lost a job or if I was invited to a a different station or if our station that we were on they changed the format and we you know an entire air staff became jockless you know like jobless Um, most of what has happened in my career was out of my control Mm -hmm. but I've always trusted that the universe somehow has a bigger plan for me. You would say God has a bigger plan. Um, I would say that I just tune into that. I learned how to meditate many years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, and even before I was a meditator, I would just sit with something and decide, what do I want to do from here? This has happened to me. Now, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And then, I believe the bigger dream that I've always had for myself, which was to be successful at doing what I love Mm -hmm. and what I love has changed over the years, right? So, and I just keep moving forward in the direction of achieving some of my wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. So what would you say were some of the sparks in your journey that made you realize you could use your voice to earn a living? You were on the radio, you were doing that, but then, like you said, your what you wanted to do, um, you transitioned into a voice over. And um, what 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 sparked um, you to make you feel like mm-hmm. this is something like because people you probably were getting um, feedback from people about right. that um, the incredible voice that you you had developed. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, as a DJ, especially if you're here in LA, you're not really encouraged to be a voiceover, especially mm. if you started in the '80s and '90s here in LA when I did. Um, it was always like, no, you have to be an actor to be a great voiceover artist. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had acting skills, but that my desire to be a broadcaster took me on a certain path. But once I booked the job and became the first woman in history to announce the Oscars, Mm -hmm. I was doing mornings on the wave here in LA. Right. Three months after I booked the Oscars, I was fired from the wave. they replaced me in the morning show Mm -hmm. with uh, someone else. And so there I was jobless. And my husband actually said to me, um, because he was working with radio stations, Mm -hmm. he said, let me see if I can get my radio stations to start using you to do what we call imaging. So he would say to his stations, hey, my wife is a voiceover artist. She just did the Oscars. She can do your call letters. Mm -hmm. So early on in the radio Mm. imaging world, which is huge now for voice actors, Benstown, uh, Mix, they create production for radio stations around the country, um, actually globally. And so they're able to put people into different stations Mm -hmm. anyway my agent uh uh at at atlas talent they were able to help me start getting radio stations i built 
up about 35 radio stations early in my my voiceover career in the 90s. 35, wow. Uh, and the best part about being a imaging voiceover artist is that those are annual contracts and they pay you monthly mm -hmm. for X. Like right. you'll give us two pages of you know copy a month for X amount. It's generally based on market size mm -hmm. and, and how much copy you're going to get. So that started my radio career. But again, I had been fired mm -hmm. and I decided that I'm not going to pursue radio anymore. being a DJ anymore. It was 1993 and I was done. So I decided, well, um, well, actually, I think my career was decided for me because once I did the Oscars, producers in television are not really good at being proactive but they're right. reactive. And so when I did the Oscars, they're all like, we should have a woman. So the Emmys, the AFI awards, the Tonys, all of the different shows started using a woman. And since I was the only vetted woman, right. I got to do all of the shows first. Right. And now there are so many women that do live. And you paved so the way. I was able to kick the door open and now many yeah. women are doing it. So for those who are listening and, and you know, um, there are so many talented people out there and sometimes people, they have so many fears. I, I have fear, even hosting this uh, podcast, I had to be, somebody had to be pushing me to do it because people keep saying, why don't you go back to what you used to do? And I, I don't want to fail or I have fear. I want it to be perfect. And, you know, I actually ended up getting um, someone to work with, but it's it's terrifying um for those but for those who um who are listening and and maybe have some interest in this area you speak about imaging just for the benefit of those that are listening could you just explain what exactly oh, sure. that is so um first i'll say some of the genres that i work in are promo that's mm -hmm. television so i'm the female voice of abc news mm -hmm. and i do nightline good morning america's third hour and promos or the open for big news shows on ABC network. Right. Um, so that's one area. Live announces another genre. Commercials is a huge genre. Back in the day when I was still in radio, I became the voice of Hooked on Phonics. And I, <laughs> I remember that. We all remember. Hooked. Was yeah. that you? <laughs> yeah, Hooked on Phonics. Call 1-800-ABCDEFG. So those were the commercials I did. And those were pretty infamous, actually. And I, I'm so grateful. That um, was really my first long-term relationship where the um, creator wound up giving me a, a, you know, some points so that mm -hmm. for every product sold, I made something. And that was nice. really a blessing. Mm -hmm. So again, what has happened in my career, it was just one opportunity coming my way. And I say, yes, mm -hmm. I think when you say yes, more often than, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be good at that. I, sh you know, I'm not even going to try. That's where missed opportunities can be. You'll never regret saying yes, even if you stumble or fumble and make mistakes. First of all, once you do it once, then you've already done it mm -hmm. and you won't make those same mistakes the next time. It's how we learn. And I guess I've just been very, very grateful for all of the opportunities that have presented themselves, having great agents work with you that believe in your talent and can bring opportunities to you. Um, mm -hmm. Came the voice of the Disney channel early on. I was talking to little kids and then, um, and that was when I had my daughter and that was amazing to be able to be the voice of something as my daughter would watch the cartoons. Nice. Know? And yeah. did she, did she know, did she recognize that was my mom's voice? Yeah, because she used to come to the studio. Oh, okay. One time she was sitting on my lap, her, the nanny had brought her and she was here. There's the mic. She's sitting on my lap while they were doing some editing or whatever. She goes, mama, I love bear in the big blue house and roly poly oly. And she started saying <laughs> her favorite shows. And in the booth, in the, the control room, they came on the thing and they said, 
we just recorded that. Can we build a promo around your daughter's oh, voice? Oh, wow. So they did that. <laughs> and today, my daughter is a voiceover artist, Rachel Wall. She and followed you, huh? Uh, yeah. About that. <laughs> um, so then going back to radio imaging, that was really how I got my start because mm -hmm. I spent so many years on the radio and then the hooked on phonics commercials all the radio stations around the country knew who I was right because I was also one of the first DJs to do such a big high profile live mm -hmm. job at the Oscars and radio stations started taking me on as an imaging voice basically what you are is you're the voice in between the records when it's mm -hmm. not the DJ okay or the voice that says uh you know a 50 minute not you know non-stop music sweep coming up right after this boom mm -hmm. you're into the set um and it's the voice that promotes things that the station is doing and mm -hmm. that's what i do so that's one of the jobs that got me started and mm -hmm. i still do imaging to this day and i love radio so yeah so you, you earlier you said you were fired from your from your radio job Job, but yeah, I, 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 I want to look at that as the universe uh, coming together and transitioning you to where you would eventually end up, which is, you know, I probably would have never heard of you had it not been you moving to this <laughs> voice over because I never knew there was Bio a mastery, job like that. You mean what I, I do with my coaching, VO mastery or? Yes, mm -hmm. I would. I would. Well. The other thing about you, I talk about this um, female radio personality back in the Caribbean, but once I got to the United States to pursue my um, school for broadcasting, I actually worked in radio and then my brother and family were up here. And then I ended up coming here and going to school for broadcasting in the United States. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'd have to do air checks. There's a lot of things, you know, what goes on um, when you do um, things in radio and television. So I loved entertainment. I entertainment tonight was a show I always watched. I'm like, who's that voice? I heard your, can you, I heard your voice. And I'm like, man, I actually have some old tapes. I went to my computer. For your listeners, that sounded like entertainment tonight the most watched <laughs> entertainment news magazine in the world <laughs> yes <laughs> i i just i was you your voice was mesmerizing and i would go home and i would mimic you i actually have your some of the the tips that you did i wrote i, I read over some mm -hmm. of the things that you would do and I went back to my computer because I knew we were going to do this. Yeah. And I still have some of those oh same goodness. things that you did um, yeah. back in the day. And But I remember when we spoke and I encouraged you to use yes. your voice. You thought having a, a, a Caribbean accent was going to hold you back. And can, I, I, can I tell you what's the story behind that? When I graduated from Emerson College, everybody's, oh, you went to Emerson. Emerson seemed to be a very good school and everybody speaks so highly about Emerson College. But when I went to, I, I applied for jobs in broadcasting. I applied to 94.5. I got an interview. And I remember that lady, we, we spoke. She, she said how much she liked me, but mm -hmm. she said, I don't know what to do with you. And the reason she didn't know what to do with me, it wasn't that I wasn't qualified. I had an accent yeah. and that really shut me down. I, I got scared. I felt like, you know, people would reject me and that just really shut me down. So my confidence level just was just shut down. And I, and I, I tried, she, she didn't, she didn't have know what to do with me at the 94.5 which was the kind of audience that would probably embrace me. But she said, let me try and see what's at Kiss FM. So if you if you didn't think 94.5 would work, I'm going to Kiss FM, which is mostly, you know, I'm going to an audience where most people don't wouldn't have an accent on the radio. And so right, right. Like I, it's a 40 station playing right. all the hits, right? It, so that that just crushed, it crushed me. And so I said, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Um, cause I thought, you know, I wasn't back in the Caribbean where they knew, you know, my voice or knew what I did. It was, this is a new country. This is a completely different thing. Nobody know I'm nobody. 
And I actually went back to school to get my master's degree because I said, I need something to fall back on. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I've, I've done a lot of things. I'm working in healthcare now and I love what I'm doing. But the thing that really brings me joy, the thing that is inside of me is this. I, this is what I like. And I just, I didn't feel happy. And so I was like, every time, you know, I spoke, I would speak with my friends and my mom would even say, why don't you go back to what you were doing? And I didn't think, you know, that I, I would have an opportunity, but then social media happened. You have all these different platforms and you can set up your own things and do, do what you like without all these um, barriers. And so I studied again and say, you know what, I'm going to try, but I still have those fears. I, I still have those insecurities because I may have an accent, but I speak well. And I, I just yeah. wish that, you know, I had given, I was given the opportunity back then, but you know what, I'm here today and I'm going to see where this takes me because this is definitely where I find my happy place. So I would think that if you, especially having a master's, that if you became the head of like all radio stations, they have a certain amount of public service mm -hmm. that they have to meet. That's usually the Sunday morning programming. Mm -hmm. And if you found yourself in the public service department, you would be the person to do the interviews with the local people. You would be a voice of that radio station, even if it's a hundred percent, you know, Anglo and but I think I think the industry is changing because you can see so many. Um, different faces, people from different backgrounds, different cultures, and they Absolutely. do have their accent. Yeah. And there are so many stations all over the world. Right. So even doing imaging with your beautiful accent, there are stations <laughs> that would want that. Mm -hmm. My beautiful accent, huh? To hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> we, if we, um, do you have a demo doing your imaging stuff? I, I, I probably have to refresh what I have is probably old and I probably have to maybe I need to to have um, conversations with you outside. Yeah, let's um, have a little fun yes. with that because I would certainly send that forward because I know that there are uh, there are stations in the Caribbean in islands around the country around the world places that have a, a more exotic or Euro feel. Mm hmm. I couldn't that apply. Did, so so you you were an inspiration to me i i looked up to you and again during that time i was listening to you i didn't know voiceover was was something you could do as a job i just you know i just thought you were part of the on air staff and you know i didn't i didn't have that concept of of understanding that you can actually use your voice like that to 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 make a living and when i look at the award shows and i i always listen i'm not looking at the people that are coming on stage I'm looking for what I'm listening to what's happening in the background and that is what really interests me and I'm like I remember when I posted this um, old radio um, photo of back in the day when I was in the Caribbean I'm like you know I'm writing I'm like my dream is to be like you and then you responded I, I think I tagged you and you have no idea what that I mean I was on top of the world because I never ever imagined that this person that I looked up to and admired, and I, I never imagined that I would be talking to you today. So this is really, you know, I feel, I feel like if I can speak to you, I can do anything. That's uh -huh. what this means to me, honestly, because I, I, I couldn't dream this up myself. So I just want to thank you so much for, for opening up yourself to people like me you have no idea who I am and when you reached out to me we spoke we did a zoom and we spoke and then you invited me to to come into one of your sessions because you also have voiceover lessons right and I also did a read I I was so nervous and then the thing of the accent came again it's like I'm with all of these professionals and I, I have an accent I I tried but <laughs> I I was I was so fearful because I didn't think I was up to the task. And, mm -hmm. but I just want to say thank you, Randy, for opening up to me and giving me hope because we need people like you. Did you know 
that that you were that you were impacting the lives of young people? Well, when I did my TEDx talk, um, I geared it toward young women mm -hmm. because the very first time I tried to get on the air at my college radio station, they opened the door and said, we don't have girls here. And they shut the door. And I was oh like, mm -hmm. you know, how do I get on the air? And they're like, go to the FCC and take your third class broadcast license. Mm -hmm. Take the test for it. And I did. And I got on the air. I came back. I'm like, make it hard for me. I don't care. Whatever you tell me I have to do, I'm going to do it. Um, so the fact that, so that's how I was able to get on the air. And that's what made my whole future happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I talk to young girls because I say, you know, if anyone in any way tells you we don't have girls here, just think of it as a challenge mm -hmm. or an invitation. That's what I say. Think of it as an invitation, not not a no. Mm -hmm. So, so for, for women who are listening um, that want to be voice of our artists or live announcers, what advice would you have, especially for, for women and, and anyone else, as a matter of fact, who wants to get into this industry? Because it's not easy to get in this industry because you talk earlier about having your agent. Can you talk a little about that? Well, a lot of people think, oh, I want to become a voiceover artist. So the first thing I have to do is make a demo so I can get an agent. But that's mm -hmm. not at all how it works. You right. can't get an agent until you start getting work so that you need an agent to help you book. Right. Um, that's interesting. Agents too. have no reason to take on unproven talent. Mm -hmm. So there are many stages and many ways you can go about it. The first thing you do is you train. And once you train with the level trainer that will get you into the industry and give you your basics, then you want to train with some or someone that's a little higher up on in the industry and mm -hmm. then they can help you get to the next trainer and only when you start actually booking work that you can send a link to an agent and there mm -hmm. are different kinds of agents there are more local agents in almost every state and then there's big national agents that are tied strictly to hollywood and mm -hmm. all the ad agencies they get they have an edge, but there are local and regional agents that should be the first agent that you get, right. but even they don't want to take you on mm -hmm. unless they know you're already good enough to book off of a pay to play site, for example. Right. Like so, so you are in Los Angeles, so I don't have to come to Los Angeles to do what I need to do. It's digital. Yeah. But I will suggest for whoever is uh, watching you that would like to get into voiceover mastery into our classes. My daughter, Rachel runs it. So it's Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L at V-O-Mastery.com. And Rachel's last name is Wall, my married name, W-O-H-L, R-A-C-H-E-L-W-O-H-L.com. If you go to her website, you'll see all the work she's doing. And when she started in voiceover, seriously she was in college and i didn't even know what she was doing <laughs> she didn't know. she didn't come to me didn't want my help wanted to do it herself and she found representation mm -hmm. right off the bat and was oh. booking and she's been booking so mm -hmm. but i'm sure she may not have come to you but i'm sure she was influenced by you and by I watching some of the so. work that you've done hopefully i've inspired her and mm -hmm. because you know your kid is like you know she's like well, if my mom can do it, for sure, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the voice of artists who comes, to, who takes voice lessons with you, are they emerging voice of artists or are they, um, some of them are already professionals? Well, I get a lot of emerging, up and coming uh, people that are interested in the field. And uh, we like to work with them at VO Mastery. Mm -hmm. The true sense of VO Mastery um, in my retreats that I hold, where I only take like 12 voice actors and I bring in the top coaches, the top trailer voice, the top commercial voice. Mm -hmm. I bring in those people to coach and we do it in a retreat setting. I used a, a home up in Solvang 
where the women all stayed in the house with us because it slept 13. And then we would put the men and the coaches in hotels mm -hmm. in Stalling. So those sort of situations, my friend J. Michael Collins does those in Europe. Um, they're very high end, but what you get out of it is really special to be sitting with the number one trailer guy in the country, Scott Rummel, a few mm -hmm. years ago. There's 10 or 12 people that can ask him anything, that can interface with him. And I think when you decide, oh my God, trailers is what I want to do, to just be among a small group of people hearing from the guy who's the top mm -hmm. is um it's something that's super fun for me to do and because there are other folks that are doing the hundred people events i, I don't want to do those anymore yeah you kind like of you kind of get i think um more tailored um to you because if the class is smaller you can yeah give attention to each person if they have right. questions or what they might need help are there any um moments where people who are pursuing um voice over careers have you ever seen someone where you said i probably think you should try to pursue something else is there any yeah. any any have you come across anyone like that well and, i tell them in a very kind way right what your limitations will be mm -hmm. like here's how you work and if you can't pick up a piece of copy and master it within reading it five or 10 times mm -hmm. and be able to audition that copy, you're just not ready. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a speech affectation that prevents you, like a stutter or a lisp of some sort, um, that will make it more challenging. But then there are some people that are amazing and they can do voices and characters right. and, um, and they have these great voices, but they don't have the acting ability mm -hmm. to sustain that character through an entire scene. Right. They can do the voice, but they, you know, uh, it's different to do a voice than to actually be able to sustain it through right. mm -hmm. uh, script. How and would you... and so ahead. that's not a, a world that I actually train or live in. My <laughs> friend E.G. Daly is Tommy Pickles from the Rugrats and uh, Tara Strong. They're the babies from the Rugrats and they are incredible actors. Mm -hmm. and they do those characters and those voices and they can both sing. And they're triple threats for sure in the voice. Absolutely. Um, I'm a little more limited in my ability, but... Mm -hmm. Um, as they say, you know, uh, stay in your lane. I, I think your lane is just absolutely <laughs> perfect for you. I actually really like um, the live announcing. I actually really like some of the work that you're doing. I, when I, I could just watch television and just, you know, it depends on what I'm listening to. Those are the things that I pick up and I, it does something to you. So definitely. How would you, how would you describe your voice? um i would say it's deep right the older mm -hmm. i get and the deep but i take good care of my voice so mm -hmm. it's it's a uh i tend to speak in a big manner i am able to project my voice in a way where i project authority yes avatas when necessary i have a commanding voice as I like to say, I can make the biggest celebrities on the planet sit down. <laughs> I, that is true. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The right? show is about to begin. Take your seats now. <laughs> I mean, they, that's, oh that's a command. <laughs> um, what, what types of voiceovers uh, do you enjoy the most? And is there anything Promo. you haven't done that you would like to do? Well, promo is my favorite because that and imaging, because you, my promos are 10 seconds long, 20 seconds long, mm -hmm. five second tags. I like working in short form. Mm -hmm. um, I have done a couple of audio books and I'm actually, this will be great. Maybe your listeners would like to in, uh, indulge in this. 
one of my dearest friends, his name is Michael Rothenberg. He is an author and a poet, and he wrote a book called uh, The Drums of Grace. And it's a story that is, it's a dystopian novel, and it's about the sounds of silence and the sound of music. Mm -hmm. and the sound of silence has won, and there is no music allowed anywhere. So it's a great story how it opens. And uh, we are going to do a live table read on Clubhouse. Mm. So we're going to do it probably in April, but beginning in March, we will start casting. So I believe what we will put up are some of the sides or pages, whatever you want to call for the copy for these characters. Mm -hmm. And we will put them in the room with us on Clubhouse and people who want to audition will be able to access these pages. And if you go to Clubhouse, please follow me, Randy Thomas, at Randy Thomas VO, which is also my website. And they have the ability to record a room or record mm -hmm. a performance. So we are going to cast and have a performance of a one hour breakdown of this novel, The Drums of Grace, complete with musicians and sound effects and, and actors playing different parts. And then we can record that room live as it happens. Mm -hmm. And then if you went a day later, you could find that recording and listen back. So what, what's your thought process when preparing for a recording or live session? I read the script. I read all the words I have to read. Then I look for all the pronunciations. Uh, I get a lot of material about how to say certain words, certain mm -hmm. names. Um, I just get a sense of the show. I mark my pages when I have a live show. So for example, I'll show you from an old Tony's script. Oh, okay. So There's you have binders. So the first thing I would do when I open the book is I go past all of that and I go to where my very first uh, page is that I will be reading live. So, um, and I label them in different colors, like live is uh, yellow, green is something else, blue mm -hmm. is something else for me. Um, so I, and I, I flag all of my pages so that I know exactly when I'm supposed to speak. Mm -hmm. I see the flag. And also I stay on page during the show the entire time. I don't keep going ahead like, oh, there's my next line. I'm like, mm -hmm. stay on page. Because you never know if something goes wrong, they're going to want you to be on page so you can handle whatever. Right. And, and I mean, for you seem to be, there seem to be a lot uh, you have to get stuff in a way that is comfortable for you, for you to give your best work. But how about, how do you care for your voice? Because that's your instruments. That's, that's, that's how you make a living. Water. Okay. Just water. And then I drink tea. I use a product called Thieves. It's by Young Living Organic Essential Oils. What's it called? Thieves. And it's, mm. it's um, cinnamon, uh, lemon, eucalyptus it's it's got these amazing clearing mouth and throat clearing properties and i will make a tea so i'll put some really good honey in hot mm -hmm. water and put one drop of my organic essential oil in that and it's amazing so i like to keep my palate clean i'm very careful about how i um eat around a show when i'm going to perform i cut out all alcohol i cut out all uh, sugar, you know, leading up to a show. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I just vegetables, like, you know, crudite, like carrots, celery, uh, mm -hmm. lean turkey, I'll have, you know, just lean sliced turkey if I need a protein. So, so it depends, it, depending on the kinds of foods you eat, could really affect your voice if you were Absolutely. going to do a Oh, yeah. wow. You That's don't want, can't have ice cream. You don't want any dairy and things that tend to make your mouth go, you know, I don't like anything too spicy. Um, I'm pretty bland around mm -hmm. the show. 
So do you do you have any regimen that you do? For example, if you are if you're hosting the Oscars, is there anything that you do in preparation for that to keep your well, voice all, announcing, not hosting? But yeah, one year I did the Oscars and they had no hosts, so essentially <laughs> my voice did it all. But yeah. yeah, because when I do a big show like that, uh, Tina Canizaro de Bone, she's in charge of the script. And you know, when they say, um, you know, and the the uh, Oscar goes to, then it's my job to escort that person all the way from their seat to the microphone we feel talking voice. about their, mm -hmm. their nomination history yeah. or whatever. So she sits with me and she already knows what to order for the room, mm -hmm. what to have on the table. I just want lots of water, uh, Kleenex, um, hot water, tea. Here's my boy. <laughs> Harley the Harlequin, my rescue great dame. He's a wow. good boy. How long how how old is he? How long did you have? He him? just turned two. So oh. yeah, I, I rescued him when he was eight months old. Oh, nice. Yeah. I can see the good relationship. So Randy, what's what's next for you? Yeah, never know. Um I'm working on writing a few things, some projects that I'd like to move forward. Uh doing yoga every day i have a girlfriend on zoom that is amazing mm -hmm. and uh it's a a group class so anyone can join uh if you dm me if you want uh, any information about it and so i do a little yoga at 6 45 a.m here in la so 6 45 to 7 30 i do yoga uh on zoom because i'm not mm -hmm. going to go back to being indoors with yoga um so I do that three times a week. I like to play tennis, um, walking my dogs every day. Mm -hmm. That's part of my routine. I, I'm a voiceover artist that works from home, from a booth. So I don't venture too far from home during the day because I'm needed. Right. Uh, other than that, whatever, whatever is meant to be will be. And then you do have the voiceover um, lessons that that you offer. I think yes. you have one coming up soon. But um, what's one thing people would be surprised to know about you? <laughs> what a goofball I am. Um, one thing. Well, I think sometimes people are surprised to know that I, I have two Great Danes. <laughs> mm. Because I'm about 117 pounds and they outweigh me major mm -hmm. uh yeah i'm a big dog enthusiast uh i play yoga and i do yoga i play tennis um what else um i don't know that i can cry at emotional commercials on television <laughs> i'm very in touch with my emotion and a mm -hmm. lot of things make me cry watching the open to the the i mean watching the yes uh, the star spangled banner when they do the flyover mm -hmm. after and we see our jets i cry every yeah. time wow i have no one in my family that's ever been in the military but i literally i get so emotional it's the feeling yeah Which, I, I, I have so many things in common with you, Randy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I cry easily too. <laughs> I'm gonna watch in TV. So I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. I don't. And me too. Oh to my goodness. About that though. <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. A, I am that as well. Oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> like I'm that girl if we're out somewhere and mm -hmm. and and I'm gonna try to take a selfie and someone says, "Oh, let me take that for you," and I'm like, "No, I can't." let you hold my phone well, that's that's the thing that people would be surprised to know about like i have to get out my sanitizer before i take oh my, my phone God. back so i am that weird but yeah oh wow we have too much in common randy i definitely have to meet you you know you know my dream i would love to do i'd love to do something with you one day so wonderful well i'm getting ready i want to in the next year or so go make a sojourn to meet wim hof in the netherlands in the Netherlands. You know about Wim Hof? No, I don't. Tell me about oh, it. Great. W-I-M-H-O-F. Mm -hmm. He's the ice man. He jumps into frozen rivers and icy water and he it reverses inflammation. And we know inflammation in the body is the beginning of all disease. Right. So 
he talks about having control over your mind mm -hmm. and people all over the country, all over the world have these ice baths now. And he literally encourages you to jump into the icy water or take an icy bath. I do it in the shower, but I feel like I'm choosing the wrong way to do it because it feels like a million ice cold needles sticking me as opposed to just being able to yeah, jump in and immerse yeah. myself. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I want to travel and I want to, I want to meet him. I want to go learn from him. I've taken an online class with him hmm. to get ready for his 10 day challenge. And but, is that sometime um, this year or next year? No, I don't, I don't know. Maybe in the okay. next year or in two. In the next year or two. Okay. Um, yeah. You seem to have, you talk about a lot of your connections. You talk about yoga you talk about meditation is that what keeps you sane because you seem to be mellow i like that about you oh thank you i think um that's just the kind of person i am mm -hmm. you know um i do get crazy and excited sometimes but i'm that girl i'm just sort of mm -hmm. I, what do you think about connections um having connections that can make a way for you do you think that also is helpful in helping people to get some of the um, voiceover jobs i encourage everyone mm -hmm. wherever you are if you are aspiring to do voiceover use whatever connections you have mm -hmm. use anyone you know that owns a store or has a product, you know, they may want to advertise that. So mm -hmm. I say, start from where you are, use the connections, you know, I have a lot of connections, but honestly, the way the industry works today, it's really about the read. The read because yeah. There's very few areas where one person is making a decision. It's, right. It seems to be more of group decisions these days. So my connections because i've been doing this a while are all so high up on the food chain that the people that are working with the voices that are at that level that i don't really have relationships with yet mm -hmm. um you have to audition and make it all about doing so the best audition possible and then once they hire you yeah connect mm -hmm. yeah. figure out how to stay in touch with whoever uh, hires you to do anything because chances are they'll need a voiceover again. So mm -hmm. whether you're starting locally or regionally, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's out there for everyone and you just have to train, really study, learn how to do this work, make a demo, but not before you're ready. Right. Uh, if, if you just want to get on a website like Fiverr, do you, are you familiar with Fiverr? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's a very basic website for all kinds of things, not just voiceover work. And just because it's called Fiverr, I don't think the jobs only pay $5. I think they're a mm -hmm. little bit higher than that. But I think if I were trying to establish a career, I would start wherever I could, start doing the work, get used to reading an audition, booking a job, having to then record, edit, and deliver the job that you're getting paid for. Mm -hmm. and you know, and do it in a timely manner so that whatever they're paying you, it's going to be worth it. And just, there are no shortcuts, but anyone can become the superstar of tomorrow. It really just depends on the read they're looking mm -hmm. for in that moment. And then you have, you definitely have to have yeah. the talent. It's not who you know, but you have to have the talent. This is and true. I just want to tell you this, um, Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak with you. You definitely rock. <laughs> and um, I'll definitely, um, I think it's some of you, someone that I really want to stay close to. So we'll definitely be talking even more, but I just want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and, and letting people see that um, if you have a gift and you have, um, or you have something that you would like to do, um, you should probably just, you know, don't be afraid and go for it. I'm still um, going for my process of fear, but I am, I'm here and, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm Fearful doing, and doing it anyway. So. Yes, I, I am okay. doing it. And so I want to thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure having you on today. Thank you so much. So much. I really appreciate the time with you, Helena. Me too. Thank you. This was, this was a dream come true for me. Thank you, Randy. Bye-bye. <laughs>